Hi, everyone. Um, hey, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I want to start off by thanking the FIT community, including the students, faculty, and staff, for taking the time to come to our event. Um, my name is Tim Ju, and I'm an adjunct professor in the entrepreneurship department uh, and also an alumnus of FIT. Um, I'm really proud to be part of furthering FIT's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I want to quickly shout out the support of President Brown, Dr. Mylan, the Diversity Collective, Bill Reinish, Diana Hu, and the FIT faculty for supporting this initiative and including it during Civility Week, as it aligns with FIT's belief that diversity enriches the campus community and the educational experience for the students. And also a quick shout out to our AAPI-owned beverage sponsors, Harmi and Moshi, for their generous product donations, which all of you must try after the event. So just to give you a little bit of context, you know, my goal for this panel series is to build a yearly platform that celebrates the diversity of culture that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders bring to their communities. Growing up as a Korean American, I didn't see many people that looked like me in creative leadership roles. At the time, my immigrant parents weren't ready to accept my passion for design as a viable career path. However, the few AAPI creatives I did see in the mainstream media validated my belonging in this creative space. This is why I titled the panel event, Seeing is Believing, because feeling seen and heard has empowered me to use my platforms to share my story as a proud AAPI creative. And speaking of platforms, I'm really excited to use this one to introduce three very talented and influential creatives that have been so generous with their time to share their cultures, experiences, and identity while emphasizing the importance of representation and giving back to the community. And just an FYI, um, after the discussion, we'll close with a Q&A with the audience. So uh, starting off all the way in the far right, Haruko Hayakawa, she's a first-generation Japanese-American CG artist and creative director based out of Brooklyn. She's worked with brands like Bon Appetit, World of Women NFT, Fly by Jing, and the New York Times. Her work is mainly driven by two themes, nostalgia and her modern-day struggles, whether that's around Japanese-American identity, womanhood, or finding the beauty and the modernity of her everyday life. Next, we have Michelle Moy, based in Brooklyn. She's known for two crafts, one as a digital artist and creator, and the other as an editorial product and food photographer. She's worked with brands like Umami Cart, Ansam, Wing on One, and Co. Welcome to, and welcome to Chinatown. She describes herself as a color-bending, vision-hungry cat lady who enjoys creative challenges and, problem, and creative problem solving. Uh, and lastly, we have Rich Tu a first-generation Filipino-American artist and designer residing in Brooklyn. He's worked with brands like MTV, Uniqlo, Mini, and Nike. His bold visual style is inspired by th his three passion points, community, social justice, and highlighting the first-gen immigrant experience and through self-expression. Welcome, uh, everyone, and thanks so much for being here to share your stories. Um, Many are aware that in the mainstream media, uh, the AAPI community is often grouped together as a monolith. But when in reality, the breadth of cultural diversity within the community includes over 50 ethnicities and individuals who speak more than 100 languages. So I want to start off the discussion um, with asking each of you what your unique cultural heritage is and how it's influenced your work. If you want to. Whoever wants to start first. I can start. Sure. Yeah, we'll go down the line. Uh, so I'm first generation Filipino American. Uh, and also, Tim, thank you so much for the kind introduction. 
Um, yeah, and uh, it, uh, my identity com informs my work almost on a day-to-day -day level. I think it's there is not just the the need to the the need to excel, which I think is uh, uh, ingrained within my identity, kind of you know um, instilled in me from my parents, and also there's a bit of a cultural aspect of that too. Um, but also the the idea of bringing my own story into my work and into my art when it is appropriate. Um, and also when I'm given uh, the fortunate opportunity to be able to showcase my story, then I really like to put it in the forefront, like where I'm actually being inspired by, by the, the look and the feel and also the people and the energy of my homeland back in the Philippines. So uh, it, it, it informs my work and my life in a range. Um, and also it, it's something that I like to think about um, even in my, in my meditative time. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm first generation Chinese American as well. Um, I feel like um, being the firstborn in the first Chinese American generation in my family has a whole set of responsibilities and management that I have definitely taken into my work ethic. And, um, you know, I think trying to take the Chinese part of my identity into my work is a little harder because we're, I've never really been there. And so I kind of use my community and like family to learn more about the heritage and everything to bring that into the work. And then the American part is like definitely the colors and everything that inspires me from like toys and things. So I feel like they inform, you know, my style and my palettes and concepts. Hi, I'm Haruko. I'm a first-generation Japanese-American. Um, and I would say that my, my culture and my heritage influence a lot of the work that I do. I think when it comes to my personal CG work, I'm really inspired by some of the things that I saw in my house growing up, like magazines from the 80s and 90s. They're kind of grainy. There's, there's just this this kind of perspective and glitz to them. And I think about that a lot when I'm creating my work. I'm also on a more maybe sort of literal or technical level, I'm heavily inspired by ukiyo-e Japanese prints. And some of the things I love about that sort of work is the flatness of Japanese art. And it's not something that's overly obvious, I think, in the work that I do, but I do try and make my CG renders look like they're kind of flat. And I love to work with things like gradients and grain because I love bringing in those touches of Japanese art in my work in maybe not the most literal ways. But yeah, I, I'm quite influenced by my culture. I, I try and create artwork that I want to see more of because you know, growing up I just didn't see a lot of Asians doing media and entertainment and art. So it's something that I think about whenever you know, I create work. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I want to ask uh, Rich a question. Um, you know, your parents left the Philippines and sacrificed so much. Mm -hmm. And like many immigrant parents, I'm sure there are a lot of expectations and dreams they had for you growing up. Uh, being a child of immigrants, how did your parents uh, view your creative journey? And um, you know, how did you communicate your passions and ideas to them? That's a great question. Like, I got uh, two sides of my brain from my parents. My dad, he pet my dad passed away earlier this year, and he was an architect. He was, he, uh, he was an architect for about 40 years. Um, so there's a lot of drawing, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of artistry in him, and also he was an abstract painter in his spare time. I remember growing up and seeing a lot of uh, you know, interesting abstract, colorful forms on large canvases that he didn't always complete, <laughs> uh, but it's kind of like littered around the house. And also he was an, uh, a collector of sorts. He collected sports cards and also got comic books into my DNA, right? Kind of like led my, my illustrative path. Um, and then my mother, uh, she's retired now. She was a physician, so she was a doctor for about 35 years and she led a uh, infectious diseases ward uh, in East Orange at actually a VA in a veterans hospital. Uh, so, you know, that's a, two very different jobs but very similar mindsets, obviously, in terms of like being, like working hard and also Sending home, sending money home to your large families. My father was the youngest of ten. My mom was the oldest of ten. Oh, my dad is the youngest of eleven or wow. nine or eleven. It's like either higher or lower than, right? <laughs> Prices, right rules. So they would send money back home, right? Um, so the the creative 
part for me to overcome was always in myself, was always to say like, well, is this valid? Can I, it is also is a creative career actually something that one can't even pursue? Right, I think that's a hump that a lot of people, especially here at FIT, also any sort of like other extremely high performing um, uh, creative um, academic space, that's a lot of, that's a kind of a universal experience there. Um, and my parents were very supportive, fortunately. My dad knew what it took to be a creative. I think for them, they were always, but it was like the very Asian thing of, you know, hedging your bets. Like you can, uh, yeah, you can pursue your creativity, but maybe do it in your spare time. But still, go down this STEAM route or this STEM route, like what, what the acronym was at the time. And that always sat with me like, okay, well, can I do this? Do I want to do this? Is this right? Do I want to be, you know, in a ton of school debt? All those big questions. Um, but um, I, when I flipped my, uh, uh, my path, right after I graduated from Rutgers from undergrad in New Jersey. I graduated with a degree in communication and I minored in psychology. I decided to really commit to myself and I told my parents like, hey, I know that I just got this degree and it costs money, uh, but I want to go down this path because I feel like I've, I would be doing myself a disservice if I didn't. And uh, they understood that within me there was a bit of time that I had to take, I call it my time in the wilderness, where I was working at the mall during the day um, as, a, as a manager at a XM satellite kiosk. And then I, would also, I was also a high school uh, substitute teacher. Actually, South Orange, in South Orange at uh, Columbia High School, same high school that SZA went to and also Lauren Hill went to. Actually, SZA was a student at, at uh, Columbia when I was a sub there, interesting fun fact. Uh, so I did that for three years, and then at night, I would take night classes. I would take the train to, to the city, to Chelsea. And I, go, I actually went to SVA, like right down the street. So I, I took edu um, continuing classes at SVA for three years. And then that's when I made money during the day, went to school at night. It was like school never stopped. And then I applied to, um, to get my master's degree in illustration, actually at SVA, um, because I had to build up a portfolio to even apply to that. And also I was hustling at the time to, to, uh, to get published. I was trying to get published in the New York Times, trying to get published in um, Business Week and stuff like that. That still it actually happened. So my parents saw a little bit of the, the reward during that time in the wilderness. And then when I was able to make, when I wanted to make the big commitment, then there was the understanding of like, yes, this is a logical next step. And also this was, man, this is about 15 years ago now, so it was a, it was a while. It's like my mid-twenties, feels like a many moons, many moons ago. And you really started your side hustles really early. Um, and I just, yeah. I resonate with so much of what you say, and, and I think like it takes so much courage to, you know, try to um, express your passions uh, at such a young age. Your parents will give you a lot of credit for that. Um, so as we're in Civility Week, I really wanted to talk about um, visibility and representation, because, you know, they're really so important towards the efforts of DEI. And as uh, AAPI creatives, I wanted to ask each of you to recall a time where you truly felt seen and heard in your creative industry, whether it was through your own accomplishments or of those that you admire or respect. Oh, I can, I can start because <laughs> sure. I feel like there isn't actually something that I can pinpoint, um, like a specific project or anything. But definitely as a freelancer, a self-employed freelancer, it feels very lonely, the journey, doing everything by yourself, figuring everything out by yourself the hard way, um, but every time that you know it goes out into the world and it's received well, I get, I'm very surprised, so I'm like very honored and like feel lucky that people resonate with it and take away something, so I feel like that is doing something <laughs> um, where I feel like I'm, I'm seen and heard because it's, it's being like taken, I guess. Um, but yeah, I don't have anything else to add to that. I think for me, um, I, I'm not sure if I have really felt seen or heard in the industry until maybe about six years ago. Um, about six years ago, I created a personal series called Our Roots in partnership with two of my friends who are florists. And what we did was create a series of images where 
We chose some condiment containers and vessels that came from our childhood pantry. So things like sacha sauce, or for me, like a Sapporo bottle or a Kikkoman bottle. And these were, this was completely just a passion project. It was just something I was curious in exploring because I think even back then you weren't seeing as much sort of like Asian condiments and things like that in normal social media. So I had created this series. I didn't really have any like necessarily a specific goal with it, just to create something beautiful and something that resonated with me. And I think for me, I felt really seen and heard once I released that project because I got so many messages from people saying, you know, these, these are the food items from my childhood. Like I really like connect with this, like I really love this work. And it ended up opening up some doors where I, I partnered with Chef Jenny Dorsey for a dinner at the James Beard Foundation. And I think for me, that was the first time I really felt like this work that means so much to me and my heritage and you know my sense of belonging actually matters to other people. I, I guess I never I never thought that it could be impactful to anyone else. So I think for me that was really the start of a lot of the, the work that I do now as well. But yeah, I think that's when I really first started feeling like, oh, there's a community and there's an opportunity to build a community as well. And there's other people who, who can relate to this. And I guess that really felt supportive and really good for me. Yeah, same thing for me. I, I didn't really feel seen and heard until just a few years ago. I think that I also never quite embraced my identity until a few years ago, at least within the context of work. Um, so I think that really came about probably at the beginning of the Trump era. <laughs> the Trump era when I think we wanted to um, kind of, um, you know, speak truth to power against a lot of the, the ill rhetoric, uh, especially around, you know, around the immigrant community and also being able to embrace um, an individual identity. Something that I'm grateful for in the past few years is the welcoming of the, an opening up of the aperture of identity um, and um, the acknowledgement of that, especially when it comes to commercial spaces. I think that one of the, one of the most um, um, diminishing things that one can feel or one of the most like othering things that one can feel is when the ecosystem doesn't speak to you. And like that's not even like, that's related to representation, seeing yourself on screen, seeing yourself behind the screen, seeing yourself within, within your world around you, but to also feel that, um, you know, even commercials don't even try to sell something to you. It's like, it's weird. Like where, like, oh, you, you want me to buy it, but also you're not even talking to me? It's like, what is that? So that's, um, that is something now that has helped make me feel seen being on the side of the content creation part, especially my years at MTV. Um, and also even within my personal work, something uh, that I started doing a few years ago was I started a podcast called First Gen Burden, which is about um, highlighting immigrant stories, but um, through the lens of creativity. So creating a platform to share those stories. So a part of being seen and heard, I think, was me taking initiative on my front and then also building community, but also fortunately seeing it, I think seeing the world also adjust its own POV on what representation means. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, all three of you had mentioned a really <clears throat> important word uh, called community. And uh, I wanted to ask you, Michelle, you know, you've really embraced being part of the Asian Creative Network and emphasized the importance of its diversity and the inspiration you see from others. Um, can you share your thoughts on building creative connections and the importance of support from the community? Yeah, so I, I feel like Going to school here in New York City, I also went to SVA. I didn't feel like there was much community there in school. And so in post-college life, it feels like, you know, you're kind of alone again. So I found community in like online groups, specifically Facebook groups. And there was one called the Asian Creative Network, which took off in, um, I think, like November 2018. And it was just something that like we really lacked. And like as somebody who grew up in New York City, you feel like everything is here. You know, you can meet so many people. There's so many opportunities. But I didn't feel like there was a space for me as an Asian and as a creative. So once that was invented, basically, I felt like I need to take part in this. So I kind of joined leadership. We like expanded, made meetups, and had people come and just like meet in real life from our online group. 
And it was just like really amazing and beautiful. Like so many things happened. Um, I've met most of my best friends, my partner from that group, and just like so many, just like having the access and safe space of being able to share your work and getting feedback and having everybody come from different levels of experiences and backgrounds and then just kind of just like sharing it and you know, just like vouching for each other was really important to me to see. Um, and also, like, I feel like the community is also all you have for, you know, when you need a referral. Like, that's where you're going to go. It's also where you're going to network most of the time for social events or, you know, and I feel like social media is a really small part in community. There is community in that, but I feel like, you know, you sometimes need to go to in-person meetings and see people face to face, get their energy, and then maybe collaborate. And from that group specifically, I've collaborated a lot and I'm really glad and you know, really thankful for communities like that. So I really highly recommend looking for online communities and then taking that offline. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I wanted to switch gears actually and uh, talk about failure as it's a topic that's not discussed enough in our community. Um, unfortunately, so much of what we share, uh, especially on social media, are the wins. And you know, so often failure is stigmatized as a negative experience. But I immediately think of Michelle Obama's quote, failure is an, is an important part of your growth and developing resilience. Don't be afraid to fail. And you know, as a creative entrepreneur, I find that so relevant in the journey of personal growth when it comes to overcoming the fear, fear of failure and taking risks. So my question to the group is, can you share a time when a failure on a project ended up turning out to be a valuable life lesson? Okay, I guess I'll go. Um, well, I'll share, I'll share something that isn't necessarily a project failure, but I think it, it was a failure for me that might be something that one day might be, might, might be applicable to some people here. Um, I think one of my earliest failures, so to speak, I don't think anything in life is really a failure, but I, I dropped out of the 3D program at SVA when I was a junior. And I, to give like a little bit of backstory about even my journey as a CG artist, I had started doing 3D when I was about 13, and I had gotten quite a lot of online traction in the digital art sort of sort of environment back in like the early 2000s and I was given merit scholarship to attend SVA to go to their computer arts program and I had entered the program being quite advanced compared to my peers already knowing how to render how to 3D model things and all of that and what I found when I entered the program was I actually really didn't know what I wanted to do within the CG and 3D space. I knew I just liked it, but I was in a program where the end goal for many people was to go work for Pixar or to go work at PSYOP or go into VFX and go into the mill. And I just felt like I didn't fit in with my peers and I felt really isolated and I ultimately decided to to give up the merit scholarship and to drop out of the, fee the program and go into graphic design because my Asian parents would kill me if I didn't get a college degree. So that's what I ended up doing. And I think at the time I felt like very just disappointed in myself. Like I felt really like ashamed, like, oh, I wasn't able to cut it. I wasn't able to like figure it out. But I think what the, the bigger lesson for me there was at the time I, I, I kind of broke up with 3D, so to speak. I just completely stopped doing it. But I think what you have to keep in mind is like, your career is gonna be very, very long. And maybe certain things that you really love doing right now, it's just not the right time for it. So now I've been, I spent about 10 years post-graduation working in branding and advertising, doing things like identity and packaging work. And it wasn't until about three years ago that CG and 3D came back into my life. And I think it really came back into my life at the right time. So I think for me, the lesson was sometimes you're really disappointed that you couldn't make something work, but maybe the timing just wasn't correct. And that's okay. So it's, it's been interesting for me to experience sort of this 3D art stuff come back full circle now in my 30s. Yeah. I can add to that with a similar experience of, um, you know, you go into school wanting to be something. So I wanted to be a fashion photographer going into school, having been raised in the industry. 
but you know, quickly learned that it's not for me. I'm not a people person, um, and you have to have connections for that kind of work. And like, also learned that you know there are so many other things you can do with the potential degree that you're working on. And so by the time I graduated, I also had a similar expectation of like, oh, I'll probably work at a gallery, be a curator, be a print editor or something, which is actually super boring in my head, but I also didn't know what that was like. And I only got like one job out of college. Um, things did not turn out how I expected, but with the degree and my loans, I was like, I'm just gonna make it pay for itself. <laughs> so I just kind of, um, you know, did a little bit of retail and then went into just giving my 100% into spending time making work that I am proud of for me first. And then, you know, like that took off and then things like snowball, like one thing after, like, leads to another. Um, but also I feel like everything whether or not it's a failure is a life lesson because you can only find, you can only see that you learn something from experience. If you don't try, there's no way you're gonna find out, which is um, similar to, I guess, the quote from Michael Scott, I guess, like, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. <laughs> um, but I, I definitely feel that because things like happy accidents figuring out your style for me personally, like experimenting with things, playing around with tools and everything that you have access to, just working with what you have, you just learn something from it, whether it's good or bad, like even if it's a bad client, you learn you know, what didn't work and then like, not, like how to improve from that in your process and everything. So I think everything is a really great life lesson. Yeah, I, I agree with all those points. Um, I think the thing that I'll add is, making space to allow for failure to happen and also doing it in a way that also allows for the learning to be received. Um, something that I started to do in my career, or something I realized early about myself, um, I went through all of these jobs, these roles, like as a freelancer, then I would be staff, employed, et cetera, et cetera. But I started making these cross category jumps where I was like, oh, I'm an illustrator now. Oh, and then I'm gonna jump into advertising. Then I'm going to jump into uh, Broadway and entertainment. Then I'm gonna jump into sneaker design. Then I'm gonna go into TV. Then I'm gonna go into branding identity. Like, like that's, for me, the challenge, the fun has been trying something new and learning on the job, which is, uh, a, often creates a lot of opportunity to fail, fa to fail because you don't know what the hell you're doing <laughs> for like the first year. So um, something that um, actually my brother-in-law, uh, Jeff told me, he's, a, he's in finance, he told me, he's like, yeah, when I, when I move roles, I give myself the first year to just make mistakes, or I just make it, I say to myself, it's gonna be okay to do things wrong, or to seek guidance, and also to be a sponge and to absorb. Um, then second year is uh, do thing, you'll do things, now you can move things around, you're air bending a little bit, and then third year is like, well, you're really going forward, you can move stuff, right? You can actually get stuff done. And like, that's something I took to heart, because um, in my early days, I would run up against the wall. I would spend like less than a year at a job. And I freelanced all the time too. So I'd show up and I was like, it's, I've always been the type of person to go to a nine to five and then do stuff at night or do stuff hella early. <laughs> so I always had this dual, this dual life, right? Um, but I end up hitting a wall at my day job. I'm like, wow, this sucks. And then I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna rage quit. I'm gonna go somewhere else. <laughs> and then I did that for a bunch of roles. Um, and then um, I even did it, um, I don't think I've ever said it out loud, I did it when I went to Nike. I was living in Oregon, working at Nike in 2015, 2017. I wanted something out of the organization that they couldn't quite give me at the time. So then I left, I was like, I wanna go back to New York. And then I went to MTV and I was at MTV for almost five years. I remember thinking my first two years, I'm like, I'm not gonna be that guy. I'm not gonna rage quit out of this one because I wanna learn, evolve, and also this institution or organization is changing and evolving, and I wanna see that change from the inside too. Like literally there's a corporate merger and I wanted to like see, I wanted to feel what it was like to be in that type of ecosystem. It's like being in, um, in, in Inception and then you're seeing like the city just fold in on itself. It's like imagine that like at your job. Um, so I set a goal for myself to say I wanna feel this and then I can I, and then I can choose to change and evolve. And then at my new role at JKR, 
same thing, I'm kind of going through it in my first year. I'm like, well, I want to make sure that I, I make a safe space for myself to fail. So now it's coming up on my year. I'm like, okay, failed a lot in the beginning, made some mistakes, but now I'm getting my sea legs and now I, I understand more. So I've, I, what I've learned is to make that space where failure is okay. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm really inspired by all of you, really just always challenging yourself to try new things. And I think, um, you know, there's a huge learning group curve, but uh, I think all that leads to a lot of personal growth. Um, Haruka, you know, you really have a compelling, compelling story with your diverse background, which includes <laughs> working in a range of creative spaces. Um, and as a self-taught CG artist, I really admire the big leap you made to work for yourself. Can you share your thoughts on the importance of creative growth when it comes to pursuing passion projects and side hustles? Yeah, this is something I feel quite strongly about. I would say that personal projects is the key to my entire career. I get asked pretty often, you know, like, how have I gotten jobs like working on the cover of Bon Appetit or working with the New York Times or Panera Bread or Sky Vodka or any, any, any of the clients that I've worked with? or moving between branding identity into still life photography to food styling and now into 3D. And the key to all of this has been personal work. And I think the secret here when it comes to understanding how you get the projects that you want to work on, it's understanding that whatever is in your portfolio is what you're going to get hired to do more of. So that's why I think it's really important that you're creating the work that you want to be getting more of at the end of the day. And I think that it's really powerful and also freeing when you understand that because you can start to strategically navigate your career and also have the like be able to drive where you go next that's how i've moved between different industries different creative disciplines it's all been because of that so then i get asked a lot like well how the hell do you have time to do this like that's a lot so for me i am a big stickler for having a creative practice on a near daily basis and I think take what I say with a grain of salt because the way I'm going to talk about it is the way it works for me but I think if you want to have a creative practice you need to figure out like what times of days work with you what's your circadian rhythm when is your focus the sharpest so for me personally like somehow in my 30s I've turned into a morning person so I wake up at 6 30 or 7 o'clock in the morning I'll drink something caffeinated I do about a 10 minute meditation and then I spend at minimum an hour on personal work and on a normal day I may average any probably more like two to three hours but I'm self-employed so I do get to sort of set my own work schedule on a daily basis and after I'm done with that that is when I start my client work so what I'm doing is that the priority when it comes to my creative work is my creative vision, my creative goals, and even to not sound corny, but like my own dreams and what I want to be doing with my life. And I think it's really important, especially if you want to be doing something entrepreneurial, to like keep focus on these things that actually really matter to you. And I think I, I've worked at ad agencies and brand agencies as a graphic designer in the past, and you know these. These places are jobs, like your, your boss may know what you want to be doing with your career and what sorts of projects you want to work on, but there's a lot of politics that goes into agency life. There's, you're going to work on bank brands that feel soulless and that don't align with your values or, or like creating an identity for like a, like a cement manufacturing company and it's corporate and you just like don't give a shit about it. But you have to do these things because it's what pays your job and what pays your salary. So I think you know, have these things that are paying your bills and that are paying your rent, but at the same time, just don't forget what you were trying to do with your work and always make time for that. I think it's so valuable and so vital so that you can drive your career and you don't feel like you're being pulled along by maybe this agency job or working for a brand or, or whatever it is. I think it's so important to always keep in mind your creative vision and dreams and for me at least, having a creative practice is what's opened up all the doors to all the projects I've been on and to all the brands that I've worked with. So it's something I feel very, very strongly about. Thank you so much for sharing that. And <clears throat> I'm sure it's taken so much hard work for all of you to get to where you are right now. And so I want to talk about, um, you know, burnout and mental health. And, you know, Michelle, for you, you know, you're such a go-getter uh, and creatively speaking, you know, in your family, uh, you were the first to test the waters. And so with your incredible work ethic, I imagine it must have, you know, involved a lot of late nights finishing projects while avoiding burnout. 
and um, I wanted to ask if you could share your thoughts on the importance of caring for your mental health and uh, practicing self-care. Yeah, that's a really great subject. Like, it, I also learned that the hard way, that you know, you do not want to burn out, you want to manage your time well, put in schedule free time to rest between projects especially. It sounds super exciting in the beginning when you're like, oh yeah, I can do this, and then like, you know, when the time comes, it's like, no, I can't. Especially at the end, you have to, you know, just take the two hours, the 10 hours, or the week off just to recover. Um, my practices involve just like, you know, we make our own schedule, so, or at least I do, and like, you know, nobody's going to come into your room and just be like, okay, it's time to clock out. Nobody's going to tell you like, okay, time to wake up and whatever. So you make your own schedule. And for me, over time, I realized, you know, w nobody's checking their emails at like 1 a.m. when you want to deliver something. It is not important. It can wait till the next day. Um, where I draw the line for my own practices is like, you know, stopping work around dinner time, come back to it the next morning, um, like have your own routine, have the weekends off, you know, turn your phone off, like do not allow any messages to come through. Um, and then also just things like scheduling your massages or whatever else you need to take care of your body. Um, and I, I want to like give an example of the first time that I really experienced burnout. It was working for a uh, music cover art and it was like really exciting to me. So I was like, I really want to do this. I want to get everything right and just like communicate as quickly as I can with my deliverables and examples. And, you know, I learned that, you know, everybody's working on different time zones. So just because they're messaging or emailing you at 12 a.m., it's actually like 3 a.m. for you or, you know, they're on the other side of the world, you do not need to respond. You, have to, you should work on your own schedule, respect your own boundaries, create those boundaries, um, for the sake of your health, nothing is worth it. Um, they can wait. Um, yeah, that's like, yeah, just please prioritize yourself. <laughs> I learned it, like, you know, definitely the hard way. That's so important. I also want to open it up to Haruko and Rich if you also want to chime in, because I know both of you have extremely busy schedules too, if you have any, um, any feedback or advice you want to share in terms of, you know, how to make sure you're caring for your mental health. I'll jump in. For, for me, for mental health, like, it's, it's something that's at the very top of mind. And I know that for you know, high-performing creatives, you're always thinking, like, go, 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 and also win, win, win. Um, that's also very top of mind. Um, I've started to take the practice of, well, one, also when, in my 30s, I also became a morning person, which is funny. So it just naturally happens to you. I'm in my 40s now. I'm just like, oh, I'm even more of a morning person now. It's wild. Um, so... I started, well, my circadian rhythm started to change, so I start to be very conscious of when I wake up and when I go to sleep, being conscious of that. And also, uh, yeah, physical fitness is a big part of my mental health strategy and regime, so I work out <laughs> like five to six days a week now. It used to be like three. I had very different goals when I was young. They don't give uh, trophies for being the biggest dude in the office, FYI, so <laughs> there's that. Now I just want to be like very fit and agile. Um, and yeah, and also I watch my caffeine levels. I used to be like a four coffee, cup of coffee a day guy. I've started drinking mud water. This is not an ad. I <laughs> uh, started taking caffeine alternatives just to kind of like level out and also pace myself a little bit more. Wow, we're like very similar. So, <laughs> um, you know, the, the mental health aspect of creative in my job is something that I still struggle with. I struggle with it on a normal basis. I have very high anxiety. I've struggled with anxiety attack issues for quite a while, actually. And a few things that have worked for me are sometimes when I'm dealing with something like imposter syndrome, um, for example, and things feel really overwhelming and I'm really doubting my ability to do something, I think one of the most powerful things that I've learned to do is just pause and just maybe not look at that email again until tomorrow because it's not going to be the end of the world if you don't email within the hour. And pausing helps me sort of adapt, accept whatever situation I'm in or whatever challenge or whatever task I'm given. And then once I've switched my mind into being a little bit more clear, a little bit more calm, 
then I can problem solve. And that's where creativity, I think, also happens. And similarly, I also stopped drinking coffee. I now drink matcha, or I don't drink any caffeine at all, and that has really helped my anxiety. <laughs> oh, thank you. <clears throat> I have yet today to, to uh, find an alternative for coffee, but I'll definitely keep that in mind. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to close with one last question. You know, all of you uh, were students in the past with big dreams and ambitions. And so if you could imagine seeing your younger self um, in the audience right now, uh, what words of wisdom would you like to share? I'll start. When I was younger, and I feel like younger as in like even just six years ago or last year, um, I'm very introverted and quiet. I definitely still picture my younger self in school and how I never raised my hand to participate, zero participation. But like, so what I would say to myself is, you know, just speak up. Like, nobody's gonna know what you want or what you need unless you ask for it. There's, nobody's gonna read your mind. Um, it, I also get anxiety from like just like overthinking like oh how are they gonna respond like how how am I gonna react like when, with what they respond what if I don't get what I need nobody's going to know unless you let them know. Yeah, I think that's a really that's a really important point. I think for me as a student, I always have this mindset since I've been in college. I think one of my professors at SVA might have mentioned this to me, but the mindset is be a sponge. Um, soak up information, you're there to learn, whether it's in your classes or at an internship. Just be there for the experience and try to take in all of the information you can. Ask questions if you're confused. I've definitely, you know, when I was a creative director, sometimes I think when I worked with interns or people straight out of school, I think they're confused, but they're not asking a question, and I know they're confused, so just ask because I, I'm happy, and I think whoever you're working with is more than happy to just clarify what they're saying so that you feel less stressed out and you feel like you have an idea of what you need to do, whatever the task may be. I think the second, the second thing I would I would give advice for is make time for yourself. It's sort of similar to what I was saying about having personal work. Just make time for yourself and things that you're curious about and things you want to learn more about. If you even put just like 30 minutes to an hour a couple times a week, you'll be really surprised at what you can accomplish in a month, in six months. You can really make big strides and changes. So I think that's something I wish that I understood a little bit better and I didn't have to wait until my late 20s to, to get the hang of, I guess. I'm gonna double tap on everything that Michelle and Haruka just said. <laughs> like literally, communication is so key, especially when you're coming up and also when you're you know, talking to those that are you know, behind you, right? So I think the advantage of learning to communicate, especially early in this stage, is one, to make sure that you articulate what you want, because I think every time you walk into a room, especially your room with, uh, that's work-based or school-based or academic-based, one should have goals walking into that room, so know what you want to achieve or retrieve or receive from the room. So at, while you finish your sentences, essentially is what I'm saying. Make sure there's an ask or something. <laughs> Right? So even if you go for a job interview, just like, hey, talking money now. Hey, this is what I want now. Like, this is what I'm looking for now. People receive that and they also are not offended by it. Um, and also I think when you're working with, um, with leaders, um, especially when you enter the industry, uh, what the, being able to articulate your work and also being able to ask for things, because leaders want to be able to give you something. It makes leaders feel good when you articulate that you've received something from them because it makes them feel nice, but also you can tell like the, the message has been received. So when you're silent or when you're not vocalizing or when you're not talking through your work in an effective way, that actually makes the work and the project lesser. It makes for a more difficult process. So I, I would really say learn to articulate um, the value that your work is bringing to the table so that leaders will understand what that value is and know how to help you. Um, the other thing I'd say is, yeah, don't be an asshole. Like, really, like, base level, don't be a jerk, and that will take you so much farther than, um, than some other skill sets out there. So, yeah, that's just at, at the base, at the core. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> I actually uh, now want to open the floor up and see if um, there are any questions you may have for our panelists. Uh, all you have to do is just raise your hand and we'll pass over a, a mic to you. I wanted to ask all three of you, now in hindsight, what was a very scary decision at the time, but now you feel like was like a risk that really paid off in your career? Something it was a that scary decision that you made yeah, I think, at the time, yeah. I think I would. I think this might answer your question maybe, but just, so I think something that I went through that was really scary at the time, I, when I graduated out of art school, I worked in advertising for a year and it was one of the most difficult jobs I've ever had. The hours were crazy, the partying was crazy, the workload was crazy, and I completely burnt out of that job. And I decided to just quit that job and I had nothing else lined up, but I had this like, I just knew that I had to take care of myself and I had to get out of this, this job. And I knew ultimately in my career, I wanted to work for myself. I didn't think I'd be doing that at that phase of my life, but I just did it. And I think I was really surprised at the fact that I was so scared, but I was able to kind of hit the ground running and figure out how to become a freelance designer. I just got on LinkedIn and I talked to my old coworkers who were freelancers and I was able to figure it out and I think um, sometimes believing that you can be resilient and that you can figure out what you need to do is, is really important. I think that's what I learned. I'm more resilient than I think I am. Um, I think doing, for no, no project in particular, but like just doing what makes you uncomfortable is also super important to your process and the work that you're going to put out. Because for me personally, I've made my college thesis was actually something that I was really scared to, to make, actually. Um, it was about my multi-hyphenate identity. Um, it was something that was extremely personal to me. I think, actually, nobody has seen it except my thesis class, because I don't want it to, like, be too public. But it was about, you know, like, family and, like, my responsibilities and, like, just, like, kind of making that work was very therapeutic for me to just get it out in the system, get it out of my system in the way that I can best express it, which is through photography, through drawing and art. And so it was really, really uncomfortable for me to show it and talk about it to people that I don't know or who don't understand it, but it really helped me articulate like what I'm trying to put into words and you know, as like a visual artist, it's really hard to put things into words, like even speaking sometimes. So critique classes and like just talking about it in front of everybody really helped me a lot in you know trying to see what I'm trying to get through like whatever the hump is um, whether it's like a project or like a personal thing um, but yeah I really think I really suggest you know doing things that make you uncomfortable whether it's a taboo thing that you know the world might be like ew why are you doing that or like what is this you know like like work with weed, work with like vibrators, like just do it if it, it's something that excites you and like, you know, what makes you want to create more work. Yeah. I think for me for a uh, big risk was probably moving cross country for a job. Um, Cause I, you, you think like, oh wow, this is the dream, but also uh, I'm gonna leave, my family's here, my friends are here. I don't know anybody in Oregon, this is for Nike. I remember thinking it was a whole engagement for a summer of like, is this the right move? There's a recruitment process. And I, I'm, be, I'm very fortunate, I recognize how fortunate I am that that process happened because it felt like being recruited to the Yankees, you know? Changing categories, but also being able to engage with my personal fandom. Like I'm a sneakerhead, I've been collecting sneakers since college. I have like over 200 pairs like that are just active in my apartment, I need to like, do a bit of a purge, um, stop by the, the storage unit. Um, but um, yeah, like I remember thinking, this is a risk, changing my life. I don't know this side of creativity on the business level, so what am I actually stepping into? Spent the year and a half, like almost two years learning, um, it, but then, you know, I said it earlier, I, the organization and I, like it was time to move. So I was like, mm. 
Am I going to make the risk again and then move back across country again on my own dime this time? Like, what's the perception of me from an industry level if I do this again? Because I had a whole going away party at like the old art directors club, L turned that place into a into a sane house, right? Um, I was like, I had a going away party like <laughs> like 18 months ago. What the hell am I doing? Um, so the risk of moving back was the bigger risk than the move there. But then it paid off because I think, well, one, um, when you associate yourself with a brand on a certain level, like, and with a certain level of embeddedness, then you have um, leverage for other things that you wanna do. Then my immediate move afterwards was MTV, and that was another, they were like, oh yeah, you worked at Nike, come to MTV, you worked in entertainment, do this. So it was just like an, an accumulation of things. So I say that to say, the, whenever you think something might be a risk, because you're making a leap, then it actually will more than likely pay off because the leap is what people see and that's the thing that you learn from. So I took two leaps, one going back and one coming, coming back. One going to and coming back. I love Thank that. Thank you so much. Um, hi, my name is Edwin and I personally love all your guys' work. I think it's amazing. It's cool and everything else. But a lot of me and a lot of my friends are first generation, and a topic that comes up a lot would be, how do you, like, both my parents are immigrants from Mexico, and I don't, they don't have any connections to the creative industry or any connections to, like, anything outside their own, like, jobs, respectively. Um, and something that comes up a lot with me and my friends is that how do you, like, make these connections that are locked? I know a lot of my classmates have these connections already because their parents worked in the industry, everything else, but I personally do not. So how do you start those connections where you don't have any? I can start this one. I think it's tough in the pandemic era. <laughs> it's tough in the pandemic era because when I was in school, again, many moons ago, there was a lot of handshakes and a lot of like, you know, seeing each other in person and also leveraging your professors and teachers to like leveraging their networks, but in an IRL environment, I remember the first illustration I ever got with the New Yorker was because I got a critique from Max Bode, who was an AD at the time in 2006, came to visit my MFA class at SVA. And then I, I knew that he was coming, so I caught him in the elevator so I could go with him in the elevator up to the classroom and chat him up. And then uh, it was like a total, I was like, I'm gonna be like schmoozy, schmoozy guy. Um, and he gave me a good review in the class, and then there was a party for the American Illustration, American Photography over at Angel Orissance, where they have it annually for the two big annuals, it's in November, it's a good party to go to. And then I saw him there, and he was like, oh, hey, Rich, I remember you, I was like, hey, Max, he's like, hey, uh, hey, by the way, you just graduated? Well, I'm gonna send you an email, I might have some work for you. So I got my first illustration in the New Yorker because I did that physical IRL handshake connection six months prior. And it's harder now. I think that still leveraging your professors and leaning to those that you know who do have networks, I don't think it's bad to ask to, like, to glom on, to lean into, and also to take more opportunities where you can be around those people that have those networks. So I think it's a different, uh, just a different game right now, but I think the, the, the goal is still the same. Yeah, I think, I, I agree with what everything Rich said. You know, I didn't necessarily come into the industry with my parents having any connections at all within the sort of work that I do, so don't feel like everybody else does because my parents definitely didn't. Um, I think one thing that might be really helpful, especially in this day and age, is to leverage platforms like Instagram, actually. I get a lot of DMs, I also send out a lot of DMs to network with people that I want to get to know more. If you have a creative that you really admire, DM them on Instagram and see if they'll chat. Like I've grabbed coffee quite a bit with people who are maybe earlier in CG and they want to be doing the sorts of work that I'm doing and I've actually ended up handing them a lot of work that I can't take on. Maybe it's either too low budget or I just don't have the time for it. Use social media. Um, you could maybe use LinkedIn. I think Instagram is probably a better platform to reach out to people, but don't be afraid to do things like that. Like I'm totally open to chatting with, with people who ask me on Instagram, like, what programs do you use? How did you learn what you, you know? All of these things. Like, 
you can make these connections in that way. And I've admittedly also gotten a lot of work from Instagram, so just, just do that. Just put yourself out there a little bit. I agree. Um, to add to both points, I have things to add. Um, but for the in real life experiences, um, I do also agree that, you know, pandemic has made it really hard. But um, as things are picking back up, I really suggest, you know, being active also on social media to see what events there are going on for your favorite communities, your favorite brands or things like that. They may have pop-ups, meetups, just like shows or anything, even gallery openings, like go to those. Those are people who want to be there and connect. So they're available, they're accessible to you. Just do a little bit of small talk. It makes me extremely uncomfortable too, but you know, you just gotta like, just be like, hey, how's it going? Like, oh, what do you do for work? Like, it's just really as simple as that and just getting to know each other, just to know that you exist is, you know, you gotta put yourself out there. And same with Haruko, I also did have formed a lot of connections on Instagram. Um, I've even gotten emails for people who wanna assist me, even though I am a one person show. I work from my house, so like, you, I don't know how you would help me in my house, but I am like really grateful that people reach out and I know that they exist when I do have like a, like a set that is bigger and I can get you on. So then I, you know, have your contact and everything. So I'm like really grateful to know those. Um, I also do want to iterate that, you know, your professors are your peers. They are people who are connected and you should definitely lean into them. They know the people and they want to help you strive. Um, my, I think like my thesis professor also, you know, got me to speak at his other school's class. So I got to meet like, you know, people in another school like to talk about my project and like, you know, go to their openings too because they're also artists, your professors. Um, so like, you know, just, it takes a lot, a little bit of energy, but you know, I think it's really worth it in the long run. Yeah. I have one more quick tip. So if you are a graphic designer or you're trying to work at a creative agency, what you want to do is you want to go on LinkedIn and you want to find the recruiter, recruiting manager or talent manager at that agency and you want to reach out to them and send them your resume and send them your work. You can also send the creative directors your work, but I'm gonna be honest, the creative directors are so busy, half of the time they're not gonna look at it. So if you can get a hold of the creative manager, talent manager, um, maybe HR, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm missing any titles here, but if you reach out to them, they're actually the ones who are actively trying to gather up resumes and portfolios and things like that. So those are actually the people that you want to connect with and you want to send your work, your resume or whatever out to. And that might actually be a really easy way in to certain places. Yeah. One small thing I'm going to add to, I agree with all that. <laughs> One small thing too is like, don't forget the peer group that you're in now. Like literally the, the class you're graduating amongst now. Because that will be a group that you can grow with and also find opportunities with down the line. One of my dearest friends, he's a photographer, his name's Ahmed Klink. I met him um, more than 10 years ago when he first came to America by virtue of uh, Lebanon and France. He came to the States to, uh, to get a, a doctorate in biomedical engineering. And he was just starting to become a photographer. But then, and I was just, I just graduated from uh, SVA, so I was just becoming an illustrator. It was like we were just like in the industry together, still trying to find our way. But then we stuck so close, thick as thieves, with this little group that we became known as like this group. And then we found opportunities together. We would leverage each other over time. So now Ahmed is a co-founder of Sunday Afternoon, uh, which is an agency here in New York and works and you know helps um, get artists other work. He represents me as an artist now, actually, outside of, outside of my nine to five job. And I'm trying to hire him to shoot for this blockchain client right now. It's like we give each other opportunity now down the line. So, and that's because of connections we made so many years ago. So don't dismiss what you have in front of you too. Yeah, speaking of social media, I actually connected with all the panelists yeah. on Instagram oh, yeah. DM, so <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that. And you actually supported one of my projects earlier, yeah. so I really appreciated that, yeah. Awesome, <clears throat> thank you guys, I appreciate it. Uh, oh. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, my question is, as creative entrepreneurs, um, what resources and experiences has really helped you learn more about the business side of what you do? Ooh. Uh, 
Um, for me, it was um, knowing your value, knowing what the value is of your output as a freelancer, because I still freelance. Like, what is the competitive rate of what your actual offering is? And that, like, having that awareness, and don't, you know, ask your friends. <laughs> don't, like, don't look at the books, because the books, are, like, if there, was, if there was ever, like, a scam to keep prices down, it's in whatever those, like, um, like those best, ex uh, those books that used to go around are. I'll say, ask your peers or people that are like one, literally one level above you, what do they charge? Then aim for that. Always aim for the one level above. Give yourself the financial goal because it's a sliding goal. I think from a large organizational level, having and this one takes time. Something that I, that I had to learn knowing what it takes to do something at a large production level, like how do, like if you're a photographer, what does your role play within a larger production? If you're a motion designer and you're closer to the, the tactical execution right at platform, what are the steps that, takes, that it takes to get there and what does it cost to get to even that part? Like that I think is like the bigger macro part so that you can have dollar signs in your head so that you can always charge appropriately. And then also if you're part of a larger organization, have an understanding of how the finances and P&Ls, profit and loss margins work so that you can air bend the, the parts around you. Because money is such, uh, it's something that isn't talked about nearly as much as it should, especially at an academic level, and no one really addresses it. I'm actually, I'm kind of shocked how much money isn't talked about. So yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, I wanted to just like shout out Tim for having a class at F F T FIT about you know entrepreneurship and talking about money and business, because that was definitely something I have voiced to him before that like I wish I had when I was at school. There was no classes, um, maybe an elective, but it was like only if you knew you would you know attend it. But I didn't have any of that, so I learned it the hard way again. But um, also go, coming from, you know, I started my career working with small businesses and I still do. They have very tiny budgets and like don't really know the ins and outs of how the industry actually works. So like working with that and like teaching them everything and you know, just like doing what you can with them is a struggle in itself, but you know, you can't charge them what you're charging like Burger King because you know they do not have that but they do need you know work and you can still lower your rates for them um, figuring out like how much things cost for you and how much your work is at, valued at I think you can definitely figure that out from talking to people who are levels above you um, so a resource that I found really helpful was fuckgatekeeping.com and it's like this group um, of uh, artists, I think they're mostly photographers who, you know, we're just like, fuck gatekeeping, we're going to give you all of the resources, this is how much it should cost, you're supposed to have day rates, this is licensing equipment, rental, this is what you're supposed to be charging for, and a lot of it is like, damn, why didn't anybody tell me? Um, so I, you know, reached out to Carmen, who is one of the photographers who lead that group, and was just like, can we talk about this? This is extremely new to me, and you know, she was very, very, like welcoming and nice to just walk me through it and then also spend some time on looking at my work and you know giving me an estimate on how much I should be charging like a ballpark and then you know just like a portfolio review is also extremely helpful in being like oh your work is all over the place or you should focus on this or like your website like to me it looks like xyz but is that what you're going for for your clients and things like that so just like pushing your work out to people who are a little more experienced than you definitely gives critical feedback on how you want to operate um, and then definitely setting out your goals of like do I want to be just a small business econ photographer or do I want to like strive to do advertisement like it, those are very different and you have to work slowly for them or you just focus on one I'm trying tra trying to transition right now so it's really a huge learning curve for me, um, especially as a one person, you know, show. So it's like, you know, there's things to unlearn, but there's also things that you need to be patient with your clients and yourself with in trying to figure this all out one day at a time. I think for me, I've always ultimately known that I want to work for myself. Um, I don't want to have to work for 
a company or an agency, even though I always have. And I think the way that I figured out the business is I've asked people who are more senior than me what my day rate should be. And at the time, I was really surprised at how much I could be charging on a day rate as a graphic designer at the time. I had to have been probably in my early to mid 20s. And having that network where you can find out these resources is really important. Ask your friends. And then the other thing that I did, which might be slightly problematic, but I love collecting proposals from every single agency that I've ever worked for. I take a look at the proposals and then I also take a look at proposals that come in from the vendors they work with. So illustrators, CG artists, things, well not CG artists, but illustrators, photographers, things like that. I've always collected that stuff and I have it in like a Dropbox and I always reference it. And as I moved up the ladder and I was an associate creative director for a branding agency a few years ago, I would have to start working alongside the project management and account executive team to write these proposals. Mm -hmm. And that really taught me how you pitch a client how you put together a process and approach deck, how you build a timeline, and then how you also sort of staff a project. Um, some agencies are more efficient than others. So I've always, in the back of my head, have kept in mind, I want to work for myself. What do I need to know in order to work for myself? And what sort of resources are in front of me that can help inform how to do whatever it is I'm trying to do. I used to want to run a design studio, so I was very hyper-focused on collecting things like, what does a proposal look like? What do these bid decks look like? Like, how much are they charging? All of these things. So I think once you open to your eyes to what you're trying to achieve, you might be able to find the information that you need. It might actually be closer than you think. Um, so that's how I've, I've learned the business. And for me, um, yeah, I've kind of approached pricing in, in a very nuanced way where uh, when my business partner and I started our company, uh, it was self-funded and we had almost zero to no budget, just operating on a shoestring budget. So that was the time when we really utilized our creative network and called in favors and clearly we couldn't you know, pay these friends at their going rate, but um, they were just really supportive and believed in what we were doing and we were so appreciative of that. But like um, on the other end of the spectrum, when we worked with much larger companies, um, my general recommendation is to always ask what their budget is first, because sometimes you may be surprised how much budget is set out for a certain That's a project. great suggestion. <laughs> oh, ask what the budget is. Yeah. Before you yeah. give your own pricing, because you'll be surprised and you, you don't want to, you know, in hindsight, be you know, regretful for not having charged more. Um, and, you know, if they can't work with your budget, then you can always find some type of middle ground, but it's always good to kind of ask for the budget first, in, in, in my opinion. After the budget, then always ask for 20% more. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say that too. Always bid just a little bit higher yeah. than what you think you actually want because sometimes they'll take it or sometimes they'll just right. haggle it down a bit. Because they're always a padding. Always. Yeah. It's always, also for always taxes, there. so keep that 30%. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Put it away. One. Yeah, taxes. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, I have another question. So, Haruko, you briefly mentioned um, imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So my question is to all of you, have you all experienced that? And in those moments, um, what have been the sort of things or, you know, you know, practices that you may have that have helped ground you and overcome that? So, yeah, so imposter syndrome is something that I, I struggle with quite a bit, and I, I do want to just normalize, for, normalize, first of all, that imposter syndrome is something that everything, everyone goes through. I'm in a coaching program at the moment, and I'm surrounded by, like, ultra high-performing individuals across a wide range of industries, and we all experience this, so it's a really normal sort of, like, emotion. So I think most recently, my most recent sort of bout of imposter syndrome was when um, I was approached by an agency to create campaign visuals for a pretty established tequila brand. It's the largest budget I've ever been offered. It's probably going to be one of the largest projects I've taken up to this point in my career. And in order to even bid for these sorts of projects, you have to put forward like an ap approach deck and a proposal deck. And I just like, this isn't the point of my story, but like I've, I've just never put one of those together for my CG work. I had no frame of reference, so I just, put this thing together that I thought best represented me and I shipped it out and I just crossed my fingers and I was like, we'll see. So then a week later I get an email and they're like, 
we're awarding you this work. And I was like, oh my God, like amazing. I was like, this is crazy. Like this is like probably one of my biggest projects. Like this, it's like the validation I needed. And I'm just kind of like F everyone who told me not to go to art school and that I'll be starting artists. So I was like, <laughs> it was like this validation I needed. But then right at the flip of that moment, I felt like I was gonna get an anxiety attack and I was just flooded with like all of these thoughts of like, do you know what you're doing? Like, can you handle this? You've only been professionally doing CG for a year. Like, are you even seasoned enough? It's just all these thoughts. And I think the first step is just being aware of the fact that you're, you're, you're experiencing imposter syndrome and just pause. And one thing I like to kind of reflect on whenever I find myself in these moments is this interview with the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, his name is Jason Pfeiffer, and he says there's four phases when you're going through a moment of change in your life. And I think change and imposter syndrome are so closely linked with each other because you're, you're gonna hit imposter syndrome often when you're faced with a big challenge. So the four phases of moving through change are panic, adaptation, new normal, and would never go back. So I'd like to remind myself of these when I'm experiencing this. So I stopped working for the rest of the day because I didn't have anything pressing to do and I just said, we're gonna just relax. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna just do whatever you feel like doing today and tomorrow you're gonna wake up and you're gonna feel so much better. And I think that's exactly what happened and that's what I would consider the second stage of adapt, like adaptation was I woke up the next morning and I was like, okay, you can handle this, like you're fine. Let's figure out the creative team that you want to hire for this because I do need an extra set of hands for this project. And then I, I and then it became sort of like this is what it is. Like I won this project based on this proposal that I put forward that I've never had to put before. Like this is my new reality, this is my new normal and this is how it's going to be. And it gave me the confidence to start raising my prices just across the board now. And I think when you're going through imposter syndrome, I think two things to sort of keep in mind is give yourself some grace. I think sometimes for me personally, I need to have a little bit of space from this big overwhelming kind of situation that I am in so I can kind of come into a place of acceptance because then I can have the mental freedom to be creative and to figure out solutions and things like that. And then I think the other thing is to just have perspective on the fact that imposter syndrome can be a signal of growth and maybe you just need to like take a few steps back and at some point later down the line, whether that's a week or a month later, Later, this thing you're going through is not going to be scary anymore and it's going to be normal for you and this is just something that's temporary and it's something that everybody goes through so that's how I I kind of move through it um, I'll add that yeah this is definitely I can confirm um, it's something <laughs> everyone goes through um, you know when you get an email from like a really big client you're like is this real so I have to check the email and be like it actually spelled correctly because there are scam emails, so be careful of those. Um, um, so, for example, one of my digital arts side of my work, um, I had an Apple billboard campaign, and I was like, is this for real? Um, and then, you know, you do need to take the time to process it, but, you know, they are still waiting for your answer, so you do have to reply. You get to ask questions and, you know, like, process it slowly while you can. It helps a lot to just like talk to the people on the phone and like you know voice your concerns too um, and then and then also like once it's done like give yourself credit it's a huge win it whether it's a small win of being like I checked my emails today or you know I did my taxes or something you know like give yourself credit um, because you did do that and I think I think also like sorry just to add to the other topic of like um, Sorry, I forgot what it was about, sorry. But I had a project where, um, where you know, I wanted to, where I didn't know how much my rate was for a certain project. And I just asked them, it, it was for an Adobe thing. I was like, this is not something I've ever done. So I just wanted to ask, like, what are you, other artists charging for? Just to, like, get a ballpark and, like, being comfortable with that. Um, because I know it's extremely vulnerable to just be, like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I feel that every single day, but it's also like I feel very lucky to just not know what I'm doing and just going with the flow and being able to have this like leisure and luxury of being able to just do what I want. Um, so I really, you know, try to like just give yourself a pat on the back like you made this happen. All of your work like builds up to this point 
And that's not, that's not the bar, but you know, you just keep going, keep making better work and get known for it. Yeah, I agree with all of that. The, the idea of, of uh, posture syndrome, like usually coming up when you're in a new space or a new room, which usually is a signal of process I, or progress, I think is important. Like, again, acknowledging and giving yourself the pat on the back. Something that I started to take advantage of or start to think about whenever imposter syndrome would hit me was uh, I started to take joy in the possibility of the adventure. So if something felt risky or if something felt different or uncomfortable, I started to recontextualize it and say, wow, this is a new possibility. I know that I'm bringing something to the table. I may not know everything. So maybe I'm starting to feel some imposter syndrome here, but I know what I do know and I'm open to what I don't know. And as long as I'm like, you know, 60, 40, from, if I have a, a good percentage on top of the house to put it in gambling terms, then I think I have a pretty good possibility of winning this bet. So I started to, started to enjoy the, the uncertainty. I think one more thing to add is I think when you're going through imposter syndrome, it's so easy to forget all the things you've accomplished to get yeah. you to where you totally. are. So it's really like, I, I feel dumb saying this, but sometimes I have to like, look back at my work and also take note of things that I've accomplished because there's some moments that I feel like everything that have built me up to this job in this moment sort of just like mentally flies out the door and sometimes I have to remind myself of like, I've done this before, I survived this, I've been resilient here, like I can handle this. Yeah, be proud. I have like a painting from high school that I made that's like hung in my house, I think. And sometimes I would walk by and just be like, yo, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> just like, like, I don't know how or like what, but it was just like, whoa. And you know, just be proud of it, even though it would be like years later. Yeah. That's great. Thank you guys so much. Hi. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, so you guys talk a lot about how there's like a wide range of things that you guys do. You wear a lot of different hats. And for now, we're students, so we have a major, and we're devoting a lot of time to this major. Uh, so I'm always like, OK, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to get a job in that major, and then I'm going to just live my life. But simultaneously, a lot of the advice that I hear is try everything, do everything that you can, see what you like, see what you don't like. So I guess my question is, like, how can we juggle or prioritize um, new things to try out and explore different options but also try to focus on this thing, this major that like we've devoted a lot of time, energy, and money to. I think that it's at this stage in a career, acknowledging it's an early stage in a career, right? So there's so many things that are new. So there's a perception of like, oh my gosh, like there's so much possibility. I, and I, a bit of it's a time, a function of time as well. Um, I've realized in my age, I'm not old, but like, um, I'm not even. To, I'm not even trying to diminish that term. Like, I'm. I'm just. I'm turning 41 in a month, right? So I think a lot. It's like, oh man, for, in my 40s, what does it even mean? It's like my body breaking down. I have no idea. So, um, so, but now I'm at a point in my life where I'm starting to say goodbye to things that I just didn't care about, <laughs> and um, and for me, newness is starting to be like, oh, can I? Is the newness today revisiting something that I haven't done in a long time? Is newness to me? Um, kind of learning a new skill so that I can stay in the tools. I use the, the piano analogy a lot. I was talking to a design director this morning, actually. I was like, because I had to crank out, very, very topical, uh, timely to me. Uh, we were a bit under-resourced at the agency. One of my creative directors is on vacation for a week. I was like, okay, great. I'm going to take twice as many meetings this week so I can cover for for you know, one of my trusted lieutenants. And um, uh, I was up last night until 1 a.m. cranking on logos, something I haven't done quite in a while. By quite in a while, I mean like in a few months. I was like, where I'm actually just like in the tools making logos, like I'm like just playing the piano, right? Um, fired up the old Illustrator machine, just making some mock-ups. <laughs> so I DM'd him this morning. I was like, hey man, I just got some logos out because I know that one of the designers that we have is going to be out of the commission because he's about to have a baby, side story. About to have a baby, so he's going to be out of it. I just wanted to give you a head start. Here's some stuff. 
Um, I don't care what you think. Like, I don't care what you like, what you don't like. Just use it. Use it as raw parts, raw pieces, and then we'll connect later. Let me know. We'll talk about where it's going to land tomorrow for this workshop. So the newness there for me was like, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna wake up the muscles and and do something today, you know. So I say that to say that when it comes to juggling, I think that's at your own personal discretion. I think at this stage, there's a lot of newness, so just take that into account as well. And I think over time, you'll start to, to really uh, contextualize, this is my set, this is like my wheelhouse, and um, here is what's slightly beyond my wheelhouse that feels like new, and that's where I want to invest, make an investment, because that's what I think newness is, it's an investment. I think everything that, you know, all of your past experiences, whether we tried bread making or making Dalgona coffee or like, you know, like yarn knitting and things like that can lead into the work that you want to do. And going back to like, you know, just experimenting and trying these things out, whether it's once to figure out whether you like it or not, or like you do, and then it goes into your work is really, really helps inform your creative process. And I think that's really important. Um, an example for me, I guess, is like, you know, I try to make a blanket out of yarn. I learned how to knit, I think, like, in the last year, but then after moving, I don't even know where it is anymore. Like, I feel like I have undiagnosed ADHD, so I understand, like, how a lot of us might feel of, like, oh, I need to, like, do all these things. Like, I should try CG. I should try designing. Um, I can do everything, but um, yes, you can, but you shouldn't. Um, Prioritizing for me looks like just giving yourself three to five things to do in a day and like try to stick to it. None of them may happen, but at least you did like one or three. It feels super accomplishing to, to do all of it, but you cannot control how the day goes. You know, family things happen, emergencies happen. So it's just like a guideline for each day, each hour, just to like manage your time and make sure you check that off your list. Um, and then like just for the week and then also to schedule and make time for the rest like Saturday I'm going to go hiking and then that's it like I'm going to do that because I need this and then um, to recover so that I can do all these five things on Monday and like and also just like going out to seeing your friends shows or like seeing what they're doing and just like learning about their practices too can also help inform like a collaboration and I think those are super exciting in like learning how another field works and you know there could be a possible collaboration of like how we can work together or like you know it makes your creative juices really flow and make you think in a way to challenge yourself of like how does like photo and CGI work? Like where does like photo and design and like composition come in and you know, just like have these conversations internally but also explore them with your community. I mean, I think you two covered the basis of a lot of this. I mean, from my personal perspective now, um, the personal creative practice that I have, this time for myself to try new things and to experiment and to do some R&D. I mean, that is when I explore what new is, but I think with being in college and exploring, figuring out what your career is, I think for me, trying to juggle what I wanted to do and figuring out what I like to do came down a lot to on the job work. I would be open to maybe designing a booklet. And at the time that was something I never really explored in school to be honest, or I would be open to working on helping out on a, like a packaging project. So it was within sort of the security of my job that I'd be able to explore different things within my creative field. And I left, um, I left college thinking that I was going to work for a packaging studio. I wanted to design packaging. And then I quickly got out of the industry, got into the industry and started working on packaging. And I felt like, oh, actually, maybe not. <laughs> and I think some of it is, you know, once you go out into the real world is to keep an open mind and be open to taking on something maybe that you haven't done before. And then you'll be able to quickly tell what you really enjoy doing and what maybe you just kind of don't care for. Thank you so much. I think we'll um, wrap it up with one last question. Dan, did, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, uh, I was wondering, Rich, I, I really liked your story about the New Yorker. I was wondering what New York has offered you to help advance like your exposure or your success, wow. or maybe if it's not even important to be in New York, 
do that? Oh man, I'm gonna sound so biased, but like everything's here, you know? Like you can literally explore every category of creativity in New York, <laughs> from, um, from uh, illustration, editorial, design, photography, filmmaking, Broadway's here, you know, TV's here. Uh, you can do literally anything here. Like writers, you're like, oh my God, fashion's here, of course. Like, uh, it really is, uh, um, it, a lot of success, fortunately or unfortunately, is determined by your geographical proximity to industry. <laughs> so if New York is the capital of creative by virtue of um, advertising agencies, schools, um, you know, um, film, editorial, like Condé Nast is here. It's like, it's so crazy. I think that you have to be, um, at least at, at an early stage, or let me rephrase, it is better to be, your odds are better if you're closer to a place like New York, whether that's London. London has similar attributes. I think LA has similar attributes. I think Atlanta has similar attributes. I think if you want to go smaller market but with a high creative culture, like a place like Austin, or um, Nashville, high creative culture. You want to be in a place where you can glom onto community, glom onto industry, and also um, either explore your passions, explore your curiosity, like a place of New York is great for that, or if you have a very specific world that you want to live in, a place like Nashville, where you want to be in a music culture, and like maybe a food culture, or a place like Austin, similar kind of, kind of attributes. They're great design community in Austin too. Like that's, like just go, go where you need to go um, in order to accomplish the goal. There's a part of this that's, uh, I know I'm saying this to convert it to, it's like you, you have to sacrifice so much, right? So maybe the one thing you don't have to sacrifice is like what's around you. <laughs> like keep it close, you know? I, if I wanted to make a movie, I could do that here. If I wanted to... If I wanted to change my life and become a, I don't know, if I wanted to be a fashion designer, I could do it here. I could literally do it in this building. <laughs> like, I could, yeah, I could, and I could take the same train home. <laughs> yeah, we have everything. <laughs> yeah. As a native New Yorker, I don't think I've tried everything because there's just so much to do. Um, like, I still haven't been to the top of Empire State Building and Statue of Liberty and all of those normal tourist things it's just because we have, don't have time and I really love that you know everything runs on a New York minute it's not for everybody but for me as like you know high functioning creatives like I love the New York minute walking fast getting that energy and like just seeing things just being on the subway seeing what people are wearing everything is super inspiring and then like you know there's so many different boroughs you can just step away from all of that too and just calm down, you know, go to the beach and all of that. Everything is a resource for you. Um, I feel like this is home, so, you know, I'm really thankful that this is where I am and where I get to, you know, establish my roots and definitely the proximity of everything to the culture that I need is just a train ride away. And, you know, if it's not a train ride because of some delays, you know, I could just walk it. And, you know, things like that. And, like, if you need, for a shoot, you needed bananas, just gorillas it. Go to the deli or something. Like, if you want to shoot, a, like, a photo campaign, yeah, just do it in the street. You don't need a permit, technically, or you do. Um, you know, there's rules that you can break, and I love that about it here. Yeah, I think you guys covered it. I think the best part of New York City is you can be whoever the hell you want to be here. Nobody cares. That's great. Totally. Um, I just want to... Again, thank our panelists for their time and sharing their stories and incredibly inspiring uh, just everything. Uh, I want to also thank the Diversity Collective as well as everyone here for taking the time out of their schedule to, uh, to just um, watch, experience this. Um, and please don't forget on your way out uh, to grab some beverages from Hami and Moshi. So thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Tim. Thank you, thank Tim. you so thank you, much. Tim. My pleasure.